So um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, welcome to the CORE's webinar on subduction zone initiatives. The CORE's committee has asked three presenters to provide information about new NSF research coordinates work that they're involved in. Um, Harold Tobin is going to start from the University of Washington. He'll be speaking on a research coordination network for the SB4D initiative. That followed by Torsten Becker from the University of Texas at Austin. He'll be discussing a modeling collaboratory for subduction zone science. And we'll finish it off with Tobias Fisher from the University of New Mexico, who will be presenting on a community network for volcanic eruption response, CONVERSE. Each of the speakers will have about 15 minutes for their presentations, followed by three to five minutes for questions for each presentation. And this would be a really good time for clarifying questions for the specific presenter. Following all of those three presentations, we'll have about 30 to 45 minutes for questions for all the speakers, Harold, Torsten, and Tobias. We'll ask for questions from the CORES committee for members first. Uh, we ask that all of you remain muted while the speakers are presenting. During the question period, please use Zoom's raise hand feature if it works, and we'll unmute you in order. If it doesn't work, please feel free to chat to me, Deb Glickson, or Eric Edkin. Either one of us will be available um, and monitoring the webinar. With that, why don't we uh, start with Harold? So Harold, if you would start sharing your screen. Harold, you're muted. Let's unmute you. <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. And can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon for East Coasters. I hope everybody enjoyed their, their holiday. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity to present this information on this um, kind of developing nascent planning program for what's called SC4D, or subduction zones in four dimensions, if you will, or perhaps through space and time. Um, I'm going to be talking about the overall SC4D uh, project um, as it stands right now and giving kind of the overview as well as the uh, more detailed description of the research coordination network that's been known as kind of the SC40 umbrella or just simply SC40 research coordination network um, uh, that was funded by NSF. So I'm kind of speaking on behalf of the steering committee that was set up for this coordination network. You can see all the names of the steering committee members on the slide there. It represents um, a number of researchers from across the country from across a number of different uh, disciplinary areas related to subduction zone science. Um, we have a lot of people from academia, but also from USGS uh, and NOAA involved in the, in the uh, steering committee. So it's a pretty broad group of people. And I'm really, uh, I'm the chair of the steering committee and just the spokesperson for this group. Well, let's see, how will I, there we go, making the slides go. So as you probably are aware, the uh, SC4D initiative really grew out of a subduction zone observatory um, idea or push that started with some, some events that were at IRIS and UNAVCO meetings going back six or seven years and kind of culminated in the organization of this very large workshop in uh, late 2016 in Boise, Idaho called the Subduction Zone Observatory Workshop. Um, something like 250 scientists from around the world came together at that meeting and really looked at, you know, in the context of uh, of exciting new developments in our field of science and also in the context of the results that have come out of big um, decadal scale programs like EarthScope and GeoPrisms and others, margins before that, um, what were the exciting things in science that would, that would lead on from that? So Jeff McGuire and Terry Plank led a writing team um, that a number of us were on uh, to produce this vision document that was really the outcome of that meeting. And I think, um, let's see, you probably can't see my mouse if I slide it around, but if I use this little fancy laser pointer function, maybe you can see that. So, you know, the, the, the document that was written is called the SZ4D initiative, this phrase emerged from that meeting, understanding the processes that underlie subduction zone hazards in four dimensions, a vision document. And we just tend to refer to it as the vision document. Um, you can download a copy if you guys haven't already taken a look at that at our website. Um, some of the key themes I think that emerged from the Boise workshop was uh, a focus on saying there are uh, many, many, of course, different processes at many different scales in time and space that go on at subduction zones. But one of the themes that 
uh, kind of unifies them and unified the uh, the consensus of that very large meeting to, to the extent that a consensus can form at such a big meeting is a focus on this idea of fundamental basic science processes, but that underlie the hazards that subduction zones present. Um, so a, a close link to the ultimate societal relevance, but still a focus on sort of NSF style, NASA style discovery science. Um, another key theme that emerged was the idea that one thing we're doing now and in the past decade or so that is really a sea change is uh, looking at time evolving phenomena and the power of observational science over time. And that ranges from sort of sh very short time scales of you know, minutes to hours through months, decades, years, and even geological time. Um, that there is opportunity because it's of course a global question and problem for a great deal of international coordination. And that um, any kind of uh, field program and or observational science had to be very intimately tied with modeling and experimental collaboratories along the way. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, you know, these phrases come straight out of the, the, uh, the document, targeted experiments to make next big leaps in understanding these processes and comprehensive suites of measurements taken in the same place and over the same time, or maybe it should say same suite of places uh, over, over useful timescales. And so, you know, I think one of the things that came through loud and clear was, and, and this also came out of discussions with NSF, was that um, a futurist uh, subduction zone uh, kind of focused research program had to be just that, had to be focused and targeted. Uh, subduction zones are such a large chunk of solid earth science that a kind of uh, um, uh, something that was simply a, a kind of covering the entire waterfront of all subduction zone science um, was not really what could emerge as a focused and decadal scale program. There's still lots of room for subduction zone science in all sorts of core NSF programs, but that this had to really represent something with a thematic focus that was very clear. So at the same time as this SD40 vision document was emerging, a number of other reports, of course, were taking place. This erupt report from the National Academies is, underlies a lot of what uh, Tobias Fisher will talk to you about in a few minutes. Um, the USGS was pushing forward on their own um, very uh, substantial kind of focused subduction zone science report at a, right about the same time. NASA's new decadal plan highlights a number of subduction zone science uh, programs or potentials with new space missions like the NISAR radar satellite, New Grace uh, follow on and other, other programs. And then of course at NSF, the end cycle of both EarthScope and GeoPrisms um, kind of presented the, the uh, group with an opportunity to really think about what might come next and how to reimagine what's exciting for the next phase of big subduction zone science. So this is taken straight from the uh, uh, table of contents of the vision document, big science questions motivating the subduction zone initiative. And you can see what they are. They're thematically focused on a few of the key things that are large enough questions to really be worth tackling over a decadal scale or beyond. And yet also tied back to those geohazard problems like when and where do large earthquakes happen? Um, what the processes are. Similarly, how is magma production connected to volcanic eruption, how do you go from, from magnetism to eruptive processes and what are, what are the timescales and processes that do that? Variations in subduction inputs affecting both of those things. So looking at the sort of the spatial scales of variability and um, how do the surface processes that represent hazards from, from landslides and other things link back to the subduction problem and the crustal deformation. So, you know, the key components in inter interdisciplinary science program, um, an infrastructure and instrumentation program I'll talk more about in a second, um, and the modeling and laboratory and experiment collaboratories. So, you know, the goals just, these are just some sort of a uh, quick time series examples down here. One is the deformation uh, using synthetic aperture radar data of Seaguam volcano over a kind of a decadal scale leading up to eruption. The other is just a uh, several day time scale of four shocks leading up to the Tohoku earthquake in Japan in 2011, but looking at different ways in which we are now uh, able to capture and model these emergent phenomena and use those for really fundamental insight into the processes that underlie these things. So again, a focus on collecting 4D data sets from real time to geological time. So in the vision document, there's an implementation set of recommendations that were developed, I would say in a fairly close consultation with NSF on sort of the feasibility of moving forward. 
And so there's a timeline there um, with integration, SC4D working group and steering committee. That's essentially the umbrella uh, RCN that NSF kind of provided us with the RCN process or, or, or vehicle for, for funding this planning process um, that uh, has been developed in order to tackle these interdisciplinary science program questions um, that are kind of uh, uh, shown in here with the vision document starting in 2017. Uh, the NSF process led us to funding of the actually the steering committee in late 2018. So we're not quite on the timeline that's here, but we're not far off of it either. Torsten Becker will talk about the community modeling collaboratory that was identified as a key sort of, you know, top level component of the whole of the whole um, uh, SC4D initiative process. And then the questions of how we will plan towards large scale infrastructure, which is one of the biggest questions. There's a lot of recognition that infrastructure, meaning instrumentation in the field and potentially, you know, large expense, uh, ambitious programs are, uh, are exciting to the community and potentially um, one of the key unifying features in the way it has been for programs like EarthScope, but are a very big challenge to undertake. So those three elements, the science program, the modeling collaboratory, and the infrastructure program, um, all recognized as important to this. So what NSF did then was fund us for these RCNs, which are, and I wanna really emphasize this, this is the planning process to turn the vision document into um, uh, in a potential implementation plan. The vision document just lays out the, the science objectives and the kind of really big scale, let's reach for the stars kind of goals. Um, but turning that into a blueprint for how this might actually take place as a new program or new initiative, sort of capital I initiative at NSF, NASA, and other agencies um, is the task of the research coordination network. Uh, it's very much a task that is just um, uh, still in its relatively early stages. And so many of the questions about what it will actually look like are what the RCNs are designed to address. So uh, the planning that's funded are these three things you're hearing about today. Um, NSF committed a significant amount of money to these planning activities over basically this, this, these three years through 2021. And we were very pleased to see support from uh, five different programs in both EAR and OCE, suggesting a, a broad buy-in to at least the concept that, that planning for this SD4D initiative and looking at what it might entail and seeing whether that fit NSF's future goals made a lot of sense. Um, one piece of implementation that's worth um, bringing up, and you've probably heard about this, is this recent news that the MSRI program and, uh, and the, the director's office at NSF funded this seafloor geodesy instrument pool as a, as a first step towards some of the things we're inter interested in in the SD4D program at about five and a half million dollars just in the last few months that was, uh, uh, that was announced. Okay, so the umbrella RCN has these fundamental goals, you know, turn the vision into an implementation plan for an actual initiative, as I said. It's really important to note, again, that the scale and the scope of it is still an open question and it's a complex one. Um, we've got, we've had a lot of discussions with our program managers at NSF that have suggested, you know, um, the implementation in particular for something like infrastructure could range from, um, uh, you know, something quite modest uh, through the tens of millions of dollar kind of scale. And then potentially one could dream all the way up to the uh, MREFC scale that, you know, that was uh, something like what EarthScope did or, uh, or big ship projects do at the hundreds of millions of dollar scale. But we don't know, and we don't know what the lay of the land will be as we move towards this. It's our task to make the argument. Um, will it be an ongoing research funding program, a la some of the ones that exist now? Um, what about data management systems, collaboratories, and so on? So our task then is to build the community, and we're doing that with sort of two nested levels of, uh, of groups that I'll talk about in a second. Um, the first is to, to basically engage everyone with interest in it in these thematic interest groups surrounding the key big questions that I, I laid out a few minutes ago. Um, and then specific detailed working groups that will be much smaller groups of people that we're staffing right now uh, with a dozen to 20 people on each one um, that have the detailed task of actually designing the program, taking all that input from the thematic interest groups and writing the essentially white paper or paper collection of white papers that would represent um, a, a kind of an implementation plan, a proposal if you will, although not a standard style proposal with a capital P to NSF.
And so working with the partners, in fact, to design that viable and compelling program and make the case. So just some of the examples of the types of things that were talked about, and these are all directly taken out of the vision document. You know, one idea would be comprehensively choosing a few key areas around the world where um, mega thrust systems exist, uh, where you know that there is either potential for very large earthquakes or there's hypotheses that these are places that the subduction thrust is somehow different from places that are locked and have earthquake and tsunamigenic potential and instrumenting them in a detailed way onshore and offshore to understand the locking, um, the processes that are going on interseismically and potentially to actually capture say a magnitude eight scale or above earthquake in the act, if you chose enough places around the world, then statistically, one might be able to, to do that over the span of, let's say, 10 years. So an integrated network, you know, seismic, ocean bottom seismometers, as well as land stations, um, GPS or GNSS, uh, including offshore, which is what the A for acoustic GNSS is, as well as onshore, ocean bottom pressure sensors, active source seismic reflection and refraction imaging, high resolution bathymetry, basically all the geophysical tools one could bring to bear on this, um, as well as the kind of geohistory, meaning the structural geology um, through both onshore and offshore studies. Open questions, how broad a region and how many regions might be needed to capture those kind of events on a large scale and uh, where in the world are the right places to go? Those are very much part of the planning process, not preordained in any way. The motivation for that I'll do very quickly through is just um, that you know, recent events like the Iquique Chile earthquake that was in 2014 showed um, run-ups in seismicity for shock sequences before um, the main shock earthquake, which occurs here over this span of two weeks, and um, GPS evidence for, um, for displacements in the period leading up to the earthquake as well, suggesting slow slip events um, that are precursory to, to the main earthquake. Um, Tohoku had some interesting similar features. Uh, we'll talk about volcanoes in just a second and come back to this one, but new time series evidence that are really driving the frontier of science on understanding how these mega thrust fault systems work. And here's just an example from Mavramatis et al. of GPS displacements over the span of a number of years, actually, prior to the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in northern Japan, suggesting that, that you know, pre-earthquake um, uh, uh, precursory phenomena were going on that had not previously been detected. Open questions, of course, about how um, common persistent that is and what that's actually telling, revealing to us about fault structures. Offshore, uh, and this is the Nankai Trough of Japan, so southwestern Japan now, um, seafloor geodesy has really revolutionized our understanding of the locking of the plate boundary. All of these are offshore GPS stations and all the small gray arrows are the onshore stations. And they show, as we knew already, that the subduction thrust is fundamentally a very well-locked system, uh, similar, for example, to Cascadia, but that that locking is patchy and has a lot of complexity to it in both time and space. So the inversion of the locking of the fault offshore just shows in these color scales here as kind of not uniform as was previously thought, but patchy across the whole subduction thrust system. And in fact, very recent results um, still in preprint form are suggesting that slow slip events um, are actually taking place up in the lock zone offshore, similar to, but very distinct in location from the down dip ETS or slow slip events we've all heard about before. Similarly to that for the uh, volcano uh, side of the question, um, the group has been discussing and the vision document suggests an arc scale volcano observatory in one or more places chosen carefully again to represent key, uh, key arc processes. This happens to be South America. This is Alaska Aleutians over in here. And looking at common instrumentation on a number of volcanoes, gas sensing, and some of the other things that I just mentioned for megathrusts and look at eruptive processes on a decadal scale with these common instrumentation networks. Motivated by all sorts of evidence of time series of magma sand and recharge processes prior to eruption that um, we are seeing now. And I won't talk about them in much detail except that chemistry and seismicity have been known for a while as pre-eruptive events. Petrog petrology, sorry, of crystal clocks and understanding diffusive processes in, these are, for example, in olivine crystals showing water loss at, that can be used to time magma ascent down to timescales of minutes to weeks as opposed to uh, 
to, to many years and some of the other, you know, more traditional dating methods. The geology is an important component of the whole thing. And so um, uh, moving quickly through again, just recognizing that there are a number of ways to use surface geology as proxies for different down dip locations. This is Christy Rowe's beautiful compilation of a number of field sites that represent different places down the subduction interface. And I'll just kind of summarize that by saying that there's this understanding that, or this emerging view, I think, that it's a holistic approach is needed for understanding how faults actually lock up, why slow slip exists, why, why rapid slip exists, and what controls the boundaries between them. Uh, looking at a holistic approach to mineralogy, lithology, rock fabric, stresses, and friction. This is blue schist, neclogite, brittle and ductile materials intermixed right around the lower boundary of the, of the seismogenic zone. So that really is a link between the geology field imaging of deep subduction processes or deeper megathrust processes, and then using experiments to understand these friction and stress questions and how fabric relates to those. These are the frontiers for that kind of work. And surface processes, similarly, just a very brief vignette example. These are not meant to be remotely um, comprehensive for looking at, you know, uh, this is a, some work that's going on here at University of Washington using synthetic ground motion simulations for a Cascadia earthquake and then examining the coastal region for evidence of paleo landslides and looking at evidence that whether or not landslides were triggered by ground motion during the magnitude nine earthquake inferred for 1700 AD. And recent work suggests that there may be a peak in landslide activity tied it with um, some really interesting new LIDAR methods for dating surfaces to the 1700 earthquake. Okay, so. What are we doing now? I'll try to wrap up in just a couple minutes here. Sorry, I'm going slightly long. Uh, we have a website that I encourage you all to take a look at at sc4d.org. It's evolving quickly. We're still adding a lot of material to it. But we have links, I'll show you there, to the thematic interest groups that we're using to build our community. And we have hundreds of people who have signed up for that in recent weeks for the interest groups. Um, and uh, we are uh, in, in the process of using self-nominations and some of our targets to invite people for those working groups. We've had a number of recent events. We have upcoming town hall at AGU next Thursday, a week from Thursday, a special session at AGU, and we've been promoting and kind of getting the word out about the SD4D planning process at all these different meetings. If you scroll down the web page, you see these interest group links. Faulting and earthquake cycles is one interest group. Magmatic drivers of eruption, Landscapes and seascapes is the phrase that um, our group has used for surface processes and subduction zones. And then the International Partners Working Group um, listed as well. All three of these were building the direct working teams to start writing materials. We have an International Partners Group, uh, it's sort of nascent group meeting um, informally at AGU. And then we are going to build off of that over the course of the next, uh, next half year or so. We want to get our domestic kind of um, a large scale wireframe of the plans in a row before we go too far down the international partners um, direction, just because of location being an important key question. And that image that was used for that in, uh, international partners is just this one suggesting, look, if you want to do big scale infrastructure implementation, there are a number of places around the world where you might think about both volcano and mega thrust um, instrumentation and the onshore offshore components of all of that in order to comprehensively study the subduction zone. It's hard to imagine that you could do the whole world with the kind of density of the instrumentation that would really address these questions. So talking about which targeted experiments and which parts of the global scope make sense for a US program, which parts are being done well already, like in Japan, perhaps New Zealand, um, which places are more and less just um, sort of practically feasible in terms of politics, uh, data access, and other things. So there's a lot of questions there um, that still remain both for US subduction systems as well as um, uh, other ones like South America, um, down in this region, Marianas, and, and, and so on. Okay, so over the next two years, the timeline that we're looking at is basically right now, we are populating these working groups to get specific and tractable plans started. We have this international partners group meeting at AGU and this town hall meeting. In January, we're planning the first working group meeting. We'll bring up together about 60 to 70 people uh, in Albuquerque for three days to uh, kind of give the marching orders to the working groups and start that process of that really happening. 
Then over the course of the next year, all through 2020, the working groups will both seek input from the community on priorities, potential experiments, themes and focus sites via a number of uh, vehicles, online forums, surveys, town halls, etc. Meanwhile, they will also meet online regularly and then eventually in person uh, next year again to rough in that developing implementation planning documents. So lots of decisions to be made, lots of process to take place, but that's the kind of process we're looking at. By 2021, we'll have another all hands meeting with the steering committee and the working groups together to work on the final kind of white papers and implementation blueprints. Um, uh, and perhaps we will be able to target some science workshops uh, on the biggest scale questions, although that will require some additional funding because that couldn't be built into the scale and scope of the RCN uh, funding. And finally, by fall 2021, finalize those implementation plan documents. So just to wrap it up, you know, the key challenges I think in thinking about a coordinated SC4D program are this need, even as we plan for flexibility, because we don't know what scale and scope will actually emerge as really feasible. We need to sell maybe multiple plans, uh, you know, depending on kind of the lay of the land as, as time moves forward here. We need to use opportunities as they arise. So, for example, the mid-scale research infrastructure call that, um, that that C4 Geodesy was a response to this year, um, meaning not just creating something out of whole cloth, but using some of the opportunities that already exist and be, be kind of um, flexible towards that. And the need for focus. I'll sort of end with that, that we're not simply here to duplicate core program priorities. This can't be all subduction zone science for all people uh, if we want to make it a I think a successful and focused program. That's been a, a key theme, both from the meeting in Boise, but also from our discussions with NSF along the way. <clears throat> okay, well with that, I think this pretty much just recreates, recreates some of those, those uh, statements I just made. This certainly aspires to be one of the next big things in post scope post geoprisms world, but in no way is it already an NSF program. This is a planning process only, and really um, we have an opportunity to create something new that builds off the best parts of existing programs, um, but is not the sequel or continuation of any one of those. That it must be, in our minds, amphibious. Earth and ocean science and the scale remains to be determined, but the community drives the whole thing. Okay, that's it for me. Um, I should probably s maybe stop my sharing. Thank you so much, Harold. That was great. Um, let me start with asking if any committee members have maybe, maybe we'll just take one question now and then we'll come back um, after. Are there any questions right now? Can I okay. ask a question? Oh, there you go. Hi, Carolina. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, hi Harold, how are you? Good, good, hi. Yeah, and hi everybody. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I'd like to understand better, and you said it, that you don't see this, uh, you see this as the next, or you, the community, I guess, see this as the next big thing, but not just a continuation of geoprisms and earth scope, right? But I'm not entirely clear on how it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. An extension and growth and, you know, I realize that it's a, you know, rather that a continental scale has got the interface, but still, you know, how is it not just that? Yeah, I mean, I guess one statement to make that's probably obvious is that uh, um, those programs have been very successful and they've led a lot of the science that leads up to this. So, of course, uh, to some extent, it's an outgrowth of all of those things. We're informed by them and there are only so many models for great, great science programs, I suppose, out there. But I think the key element here is, um, is this uh, decision to make a focus on, um, on time series science and uh, a renewed emphasis on this kind of observational experiments that are very targeted. So, you know, EarthScope uh, took on very, very large scale instrumentation and was focused heavily on that um, and then used that, of course, to get a lot of measurements that were, that were revolutionary in many ways in our science. Um, uh, Geoprisms had, by contrast, no, uh, you know, infrastructure program at all, right? It's only been a science program. S um, SCEC is yet a third model where, you know, it's, it's building a kind of an, uh, a center that actually, in a sense, runs its own science program with many different individual PIs involved in it. <clears throat> I think our challenge is to take kind of the best of all of those and create a program that is, um, 
that is targeted, that has just the right balance of infrastructure and science program, and goes after some pretty focused questions uh, uh, and tries to pick the best geographic locations to address those focused questions rather than um, simply just trying to cover a large geographic region with as much instrumentation as possible, for example. So yeah, it builds from those, but I think um, the objective really is to create a small set of key hypotheses and then drive time series observations married to modeling and experiments that will answer those questions in a reasonable length of time. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, why don't we move on to Torsten? Um, if you can share your screen, Torsten. All right. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Deb, and thanks to the committee for giving me a chance to talk about the modeling collaboratory for subduction zone science. And thanks to Harold for introducing the activities of SC40 and providing a lot of the background uh, for related efforts in the community. Um, I'm speaking here as the PI of a research coordination network that is to discuss how the modeling collaboratory might come about. And I'm speaking on behalf of our steering committee uh, where I, where we've listed here the, um, let me show here the pointer options, there's a pointer. We have listed our great team. Um, just like Harold's, we have folks here from the USGS, from academic institutions, and we're trying to, to span a range of different disciplines from marine geophysics to landslides, from volcanoes to earthquakes. And I'm also speaking here on behalf of our program manager, Gabe Lotto, who's been instrumental in getting a lot of these things done. And Gabe uh, is actually someone who's working on the interactions between earthquakes and tsunamis. So we're really happy to have him here. Now, a little bit following up on Carolina's question, what motivates thinking about a modeling collaboratory are some of the lessons that we've learned from initiatives, such as the ones that Harold just uh, mentioned. And I think the solid earth community meaning geologists, geophysicists, petrologists, geochemists, could really benefit from an integrative approach that has a, an understanding of the physical processes as its core. As we collect this data, we should proceed in a way that allows us to embed those constraints in an understanding of the mechanics of how things work. And getting such a mechanical and physical model will in turn help us to design better experiments to actually answer the scientific hypotheses that we're after. And so to illustrate some of the amazing data sets and some of the amazing constraints that we've been able to arrive at thanks to investments such as EarthScope, I'd like to show some of the science examples that are really motivating our joint desire to move ahead here and arrive at a new understanding of what's happening in the subduction system. What you're seeing here is one estimate of the geodetically determined vertical rates over North America, where you can see that along Cascadia, we have subsidence on decadal scales overall, even after corrections for GA and to some extent hydrological features. And this subsidence could be related to being late in the viscoelastic cycle, as we think we are for Cascadia, where you can show in that you can actually have a little bit of subsidence due to viscoelastic effects just because of an earthquake cycle. However, for North America, also based on earth scope results, we know that there are positive buoyancy anomalies, uh, negative, sorry, negative buoyancy anomalies along Cascadia in the mantle in the asthenosphere where convective flow pulls things down in a way that is, of course, associated with present day subduction, but also goes a little bit further south. So we have one component of change in topography that is due to long-term convective flow, another component that might be related to the earthquake cycle. If we're trying to use the verticals to say something about earthquakes in Cascadia, we have to correct for the different distributions across the scales. And we need good physical models to do so in a confident way. Harold already mentioned the amazing observation that 
Tohoku Oki actually had the overriding plate sort of moving toward the subduction zones over time scales of years to a decade. And we are now beginning to see here unpublished work from the Berkeley group that such year-long variations in what could be the locking or the loading at a plate boundary are also observed for Cascadia. And that region that appears to change the locking for Cascadia lies between the locked and the tremor zone. So we have these very interesting observations of transients, and they could possibly be related to preparatory processes. One meeting that really brought this home to me was at the National Academy's Standing Committee for Seismology and Geodynamics, where we met in the spring of this year to discuss new opportunities for the study of tectonic precursors. And here is a modified slide from Laura Wallace, where she explained to us at this meeting how the Kakura earthquake that happened in 2016 changed stress on the Hikurangi margin, and that stress change was apparently associated with a change in the recurrence time of slope slope. And at the time, the Prime Minister of New Zealand came to GNS, and the Institute was faced with real-world challenges to encapture these observed transients, these changes in the system, in a way that could be parsed into statements about seismic hazards. And what they arrived at was something like a change in an increase in likelihood of a rupture on Hikurangi by 25% over three months or something like that. But really what, what is becoming increasingly clear is that we have all these intriguing observations about changes in the state of a megathrust, just using the megathrust as an example, but we don't really have the physical models that can capture things across the scale, and they can also be used to do something that can be really helpful, or that can be specifically helpful for hazard assessment. So the modeling collaboratory is supposed to help with some of these challenges. And the idea is that this collaboratory is geared toward understanding subduction zones across the scales, including mega thrust and volcanic hazards. So we're trying to establish a framework and a set of models that can be used to understand the core physics, but to also then take data streams, such as from seafloor observatories as available in Japan, as might be available eventually for Cascadia. And in the next time we detect a transient, like we saw for Tohoku, okay, we're hoping to have a model that can assimilate those data that we can convert the um, changes in the system to probabilities. Now, Harold already mentioned the observations for changes in volcanic systems, and to treat both is a challenge, but they're also communalities such as fluid transport, and we're hoping that the, um, that the tools that will be needed to generate those models will be of general um, utility for a range of Earth scientists. So the idea then for the modeling collaboratory for subduction is to establish not just a set of tools, but a set of models and a community that can integrate the data from different disciplines into a, a process-based understanding of subductions. So we very much would like to engage with a number of observationalists from geology, from geophysics, just listing a few fields here, and from rock mechanics, from seismology, from geodesy, to arrive at this collaboration across the earth sciences, engaging with engineering computer science. And to do this in a fully open approach, supporting diversity, having a shared set of models, having the approach, the models, and the data fully documented, and doing things in a reproducible way. So modeling framework is what we're after, but this modeling framework is not just a bunch of computer codes, it's a collection of constraints, it's a collection of uh, data that can tell us about the state of a certain volcano of a certain subduction zone, but it's much more than that. It's also a way for the community to interact and work together and for us to train the students that are needed to do um, these, to work on these interdisciplinary problems. And so the scope of the modeling collaboratory, it's supposed to be a center at some place in the US, but it's clearly has a global scope. 
For one, if we want to understand subduction in general, we need to look at different realization that the Earth provides us in terms of the age of the incoming seafloor, the stage at which we are in the seismic cycle or in the volcanic cycle. And we're also, so it is, it is a mandate to integrate as many uh, sites, as many constraints as possible, but we're also faced with, um, with a challenge where, um, you know, for example, as Harold explained, Japan has a very data rich environment, has something like a hardware observatory going already. There's fairly good instrumentation, for example, in, um, in South America, but in Cascadia, we're just beginning to build something um, along the lines of what might, you know, what we already have in other places on earth. And so, the establishment of a modeling collaboratory can help us out from a U.S. perspective here in terms of engaging with the international community while we're building up our hardware investment ourselves. And so the idea is that a modeling collaboratory will interact with a number of global observatories, and here are just examples of the different sites that we have. And by building these models, they can then be deployed on different sites really support a community for open science and research and training, support workshops and support um, summer schools and uh, support tutorials, hackathons and things like that. And so uh, how are we gonna do this? Uh, here's, a, here's a sort of illustration as to what the modeling um, collaboratory uh, might do in terms of providing Lego blocks. Lego blocks of, of tools that will be um, not just uh, you know, numerical models, but that will also be curated data sets that can be assembled in a way to be realistic for a certain subduction zone, or they can be used in isolation to understand processes. And we want to have robust tools that can be applied to say, run a forward model of the Nankai trough using real-time data streams or that can be assembled to understand how fluid transport of a general subduction zone can explain the petrological signatures of the surface. Um, uh, the development is supposed to happen at a center, but also in a distributed way with uh, grants to PIs in the community to um, <clears throat> work on different approaches. For some problems, we know how to solve them numerically, as others, we have no clue. So it's important to have a diversity of approaches. The modeling collaboratory will be very much engaged with benchmarking and validation of these codes. We have to make sure that our codes will be useful for data assimilation, will be useful for use in actual hazard assessment, which will be a first for the solid earth community, really. I mean, we're always worrying about hazard, but when the rubber hits the roads, it's the road, the geonemesis have shied away typically from using their models, they're good reason for it, but we have to get serious about it and we want to make sure to proceed in a way that we can do uncertainty quantification and that we can do optimal experimental design, right? Once we have a model, then we can turn it around and we can say, where should we do those geological and geodetic observations to nail down the stress state on the interface in a way that's useful for dynamic rupture computation, something like that. And and we also want to do this in a way to really help the solid earth community to do more in terms of accessing leading edge computer hardware. We're a little bit behind here when we're comparing ourselves, for example, to the climate people. And so we, the modeling collaboratory will not do this in isolation, of course. We are, we'll partner up with other community initiatives um, outside SC40 and within SC40. We are so far, as in terms of an RCN, funded by NSF, but we have a lot of interest from USGS and also from NASA on the high computing, uh, high performance computing side. And so um, <clears throat> we will, you know, if you flip the Lego model around, there's sort of the sort of the you know, detailed underbelly that we'll sort out. But we want to establish this set of tools to do it in a way that we can do regional data assimilation. Right, but that we can also work on the fundamental physics here. We can we, we want to engage with people who are asking detailed questions about an abstract setting, what is the friction law doing in general, but we also want to engage with the operators who are running Donut and they're observing some change in the system. How can we build 
an integrated framework. High performance computing will be very important, particular for access to data, local computing um, data and, and modeling uh, at the same place, workflows um, and access to databases. And we've already partnered in terms of the RCN with a number of different initiatives um, perhaps, you know, you know, some of those, you know, other ones you might not know. Cheese is an initiative uh, on the European side trying to take codes of PIs in the solid earth sciences and then scaling them up so that they can run on the, on the biggest machine. So there are some exciting uh, opportunities here. There are some challenges, but I think overall the opportunities are really there. We're trying to do things in a different way. And I just like to know about right, the fundamental physics here that we're talking about, the tools that we're, we're building will be of use outside subduction zones as well, right? If you have a subduction zone model, you just reverse the boundary condition, you have a rifting model. So we're not just limited here, but it's the approach that I think is, 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 is quite nice. And so what, what has happened so far is that NSF has funded us um, for to discuss the the way a modeling collaborator might come about. Uh, we have a website um, and we have a Twitter feed, uh, which I encourage you to visit. Um, and um, our our aims of the of the modeling collaboratory RCN are, are really to to push things forward and to come up with a proposal for the establishment of a modeling collaboratory over now the remainder of the next year. And we seek to uh, do a better job in identifying the knowledge and implementation gaps, right? We're, we're dealing with a multi-scale, multi-physics problem where parts of the physics are just, are not known yet. And this does not mean that one shouldn't build a model because once you have a physical model, an American model, you can be much more specific as to asking which parts of the system, which, what aspects of the unknowns are important and which ones you might be able to average over and things like that. And, and part of that, the process of understanding the knowledge gaps is to think about the interactions that we have to consider, right? Um, we have the volcano system and we have the earthquake system and in between we have these different spatial scales and these interactions. For example, we have interactions between the solid earth and the water layer. We have interaction between the elastic and the, and the, and the fluid part of the earth, the, slow term, the, the long term creeping part of the earth. We have interactions between surface processes and the deep metal and so on. And um, we're trying to understand, well, which of these interactions do we understand? Where do we know how to average? And where do we need to do more to understand even, you know, which interactions to take into account and which ones to neglect? We want to validate the state of the art in the mega thrust volcano modeling communities and they're actually at quite different levels in terms of the physical models and we want to understand well what are the specifics of the MCS. I gave you some examples. This is not a done deal but we're still trying to figure out um, what's happening. Our process to figure that out is through a series of workshops and these workshops are centered on some of the key sites in subduction zones where we have the interactions, where we have the multi-physics processes. Um, fluid transport is one of the recurring themes matters for the conduit, perhaps in a three-phase kind of setup, but also for the interface and the deep mantle. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we have other interactions between say the short-term dynamics and the long-term dynamics. So Large-scale geodynamic models can tell you about pressure and temperature in the wedge, which will then affect the loading um, of the mega thrust and so on. And so our workshops are trying to actually deal with the signs, but then also take those signs problems and parse them into recommendations for the MCS. What has happened so far is we had a fluid transport modeling workshop which had a number of folks from um, academia and also industry. And uh, with the idea being that uh, this is the, the common, common, one of the common aspects between earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, it was a great workshop um, with, uh, which happened in, in Minnesota. And key takeaways included that we need a better understanding still of the processes. A lot of the physics are not sorted, and perhaps not surprisingly. Um, a modeling collaborator might help resolve those, those, those challenges and um, might distill the, um, the ways that the sign should proceed, like, you know, independently of whatever model we want to build for volcanoes and earthquakes. 
Um, it's important to interface scientists and, uh, you know, we, we all know that we need to learn each other's uh, language uh, to communicate, but more than that, I think it's important for folks to engage and actually learn about each other's tools in the framework of tutorials, uh, similar to what Side has been doing. I think the modeling collaborator can help with that. And the community for fluid transport was really uh, very keen on model validation, right? reflecting that some of the approaches aren't, aren't, aren't clear yet and we want to understand how can we run benchmarks and how can we define problems to test our codes and the cross disciplinary training was, was really important and the modeling collaboratory again is supposed to have that sort of um, aspect to it. Now there's a report you can about the fluid workshop which has just been completed, you can download that along all of the presentations and we're sharing all of the documents including our internal discussion stuff online on our web page where i provided you the address earlier and um, more recently we had our second workshop the second workshop happened um, in oregon on uh, on the mega thrust system uh, for that workshop we are in the process of writing the report, but you can already download all of the presentations. It was an exciting workshop. Um, you know, I was sitting there writing down ideas for new student projects, of, you know, five a day. But at the same time, we had a really great discussion as to how the modeling collaboratory might help. And one of the things we did is we identified some of the intermediate next couple of year model specifics that would really help this the science. We identified that a viscoelastic model with fluid transport would be great. Um, we thought a global geodynamic model, three dimensions, uh, getting at the pressure temperature conditions with two phase flow and subduction zones was something that's doable. Um, what might also be sort of on a five to 10 year time scale be doable was, would be a flexible communicate community code including rupture and earthquake cycle and um, cycle processes. And it was thought that a hierarchy of models going from conceptual to simple to complex would be really important, right? We don't want to build a single black box model for say Cascadia, quite the contrary. We want everything to be fully transparent so that folks can look under the hood. And we also want things to be flexible in the sense that if you don't like the thermal model, you can switch it out. If you don't think that the seismological constraints are good enough to say anything, well, you can still use the tools for fundamental tests. So it's really important to have this hierarchical approach and to be flexible and have the individual Lego pieces be robust. And you know, we want to explore multiple realizations of models. Right, um, so those are our two workshops which already happened. What is coming up is our volcano workshop. The location is still to be determined and it's supposed to happen in, in July of, of next year. So we're making good progress there. Um, we will also start a series of webinars focused on the way that people collaborate, where we're trying to bring together geologists, geophysicists, geodynamicists, seismologists, and have sort of a fireside chat to see what has worked, what hasn't worked in terms of multidisciplinary um, research. Also trying to cover some of the aspects of high performance computing, some of the nitty gritty stuff that the workshops are not covering as the workshops are focused on the science problems. So we are on track uh, the way it was envisioned in the SC40 report. And we're hoping that we'll move toward a proposal submission on the modeling collaboratory, however that might work um, by the end of 2020. And so um, that's it from my side. Um, I guess we have question, time for quick questions and we'll return to everything later. Yep, thank you so much, uh, Torsten. Let's see, let me start and ask if there are any committee members that have questions. No? Um, if the, and is there anyone else that might have one or two clarifying questions for Torsten? You might have to unmute yourself. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or send a quick note to me or Eric. Okay, hearing none, um, why don't we move on to Tobias? We're gonna get your slides up in just a second.
Hold on just one minute. Hmm. Let's see. Tobias, can you see your slides? I can see my slides, yes. All right. Why don't you start us off? Okay. And just say next, and we'll, we'll switch the slides for you. Okay, great. So, good morning or good afternoon. I'm Tobias Fisher, University of New Mexico. I am the PI of the uh, Community Network for Volcanic Eruption Response, Converse RCN. And I'd like to start out by thanking the Course Subduction Zone Initiative Committee for the opportunity to uh, report today about this RCN. And also thanks to Harold and Torsten uh, for their nice um, and uh, <clears throat> eloquent introduction to the kind of topic of RCNs and how, how these came about. So like the other RCNs, the RCNs, uh, the um, Converse RCN grew out of the reports that were already mentioned and it became apparent that perhaps something is needed to kind of organize the community around figuring out why volcanoes erupt and what can be gained scientifically from monitoring or documenting eruptions and precursors to these eruptions. Next slide. Here's an old plot that shows you uh, a very few data points on uh, seismicity and uh, the flux of sulfur dioxide from a volcano. And you can see that over the span of a few months, we have a few data points whenever people were able to go out to make measurements. And we have some data from seismometers that show us the length or the duration of long period events without much information on their source or their location. But even with that very limited data set, we can see that there are some patterns uh, emerging prior to volcanic eruptions. So for example, the duration of long period events goes up prior to an eruption and the gas flux perhaps goes down, but we don't really have very much data. If you go to the next slide, we can see now that, uh, for example, the carbon to sulfur ratios on the left side, this is from Villarica volcano, 2004, 2008, 2012. We have one data point every about four years when people went to collect some samples and make some measurements. But if you look on the right diagram, bottom right, that represents data that was collected in real time with an instrument on top of the volcano that continuously measures the carbon to sulfur ratio. So you see that the data density really goes up and we see a pattern of increased carbon to sulfur ratio prior to this eruption <clears throat> at Via Rica. In fact, the ratios go down right before the eruption and then the data stop because the instrument's destroyed. So if you go to the next slide, so we realize now, this is actually from Cal 2013, we can combine gas measurements, carbon sulfur ratios, for example, with seismicity that allow us to locate the earthquakes. And we can see that there are clear precursors to, uh, to the eruptions here at Etna. So we see carbon sulfur ratios kind of tagging along with uh, between five and 10, there's an earth earthquake location, you know, nine to 16 kilometer steps in 2005. Then there's another earthquake that was located at six to seven kilometers, 10 to 15 kilometers. And then the carbon sulfur ratio really shoots up about, you know, a few days prior to the eruption of Etna in 2006. When you combine that with uh, crystal clocks data that tell us about magma injection, we can get information from that to tell us something about magma injection early or yeah, early in 2005 and then again, uh, other magma eject injection events um, in mid 2006. So these slides just illustrate the power of combining different disciplines, different techniques during the run-up of eruptions and 
that power of the combination of these techniques allows us then to really un understand, better understand what is happening. In the next slide, we uh, uh, see that you know, this is the uh, eruption uh, report, so erupt report, and um, that report really had uh, the suggestion in it to make such uh, community building efforts like the Converse RCN to strengthen volcano science and the ability to collect critical data at an eruption in order to maximize scientific return and overcome uh, observational bias. So the Converse RCN is an effort to do exactly that, to build the community and collect data from a US volcano prior to the eruption and during the eruption to maximize scientific return. Next slide. And we have a, um, an RCN funded for two years and it's about $300,000. Most of it actually, in fact, almost all of it goes for workshops. There is no uh, overhead in terms of um, institutional overhead because it's all participant support uh, costs. There is no salaries in here. It's all to bring people together for these workshops. And we have a steering committee and, um, and then we have these uh, disciplinary leaders. Uh, importantly, in the steering committee, we have rotating USGS and NASA folks as representatives. In the disciplinary leaders, we're covering pretty much all the disciplines that are, that are involved in volcano science. So we have seismology, geodesy, infrasound, petrology, geochemistry, experiments, gas, remote sensing, water, modeling, eruption dynamics and TEFRA, UAVs, sample curation, and public communication. Next slide. So <clears throat> what has happened so far is uh, we really started this RCN with a steering committee kickoff meeting in Albuquerque late November 2018. We had a, um, a panel session at the AGU 2019 with representatives from USGS, NASA and academia where we talked about some of the issues that are, have arisen and will likely arise in the future when we try to respond to volcanic eruptions. And uh, we had a steering committee teleconference in uh, February 21, or in February 2019. So <clears throat> the results from, from, these telecon from this teleconference and from this uh, kickoff meetings on the website. Next slide, please. And uh, the outcomes of these initial uh, discussions were the following that are listed here, strengthen volcano science and the ability to collect critical data and samples at a US eruption to maximize scientific return, establish a framework of protocols and infrastructure for data collection integration. This could also include some sort of a facility and formulate a collaboration strategy between the USGS other national institutions or federal institutions and uh, academic institutions. Next slide. And so here's just the timeline of what we have done and where we're going so far. So the RCN was funded late uh, 18. Next slide. And so we had these, uh, this kickoff workshop in Albuquerque. We had the AGU panel session, the steering committee teleconference. Next slide. And uh, we have uh, members of the community that had submitted some proposals to NSF. So far, they were not successful. Next slide. And uh, in the Volcano Cider, there was a Converse uh, modeling workshop. Now we're in the state of the disciplinary workshops that are happening currently. More about that in a minute. In March, uh, March next year, March 2020, we'll have a cross-disciplinary workshop in Albuquerque. Next slide. And in probably September or so, we'll do a volcano response dry run. Next slide. 
And during this entire time, uh, the report writing is continuing or is happening. And we hope to uh, publish the report before or shortly after the funding ends. Next slide. So <clears throat> the disciplinary, wor disciplinary workshops are ongoing. We had a workshop with a strong USGS participation about gas and remote sensing of gas in, uh, at CVO in September. TEFRA eruption uh, dynamics workshop is happening this fall at AGU. A joint uh, UNAFCO geodesy workshop happened already in Portland. Infrasound workshop just happened in uh, Fairbanks. And petrology geochemistry experimental petrology sample workshop happened at uh, pre-GSA in September. Seismology workshop is planned for February 2020. And the UAS workshops or UAS essentially is participating in these uh, different workshops, contributing uh, exper experience about uh, drones and applications. So all, all these workshops are happening and they're about two or three days and involve 10 to 15, maybe sometimes uh, up to 20 people. Next slide. And we have a Google Live report and uh, the leaders from these workshops are encouraged to fill in the, the results of the discussions and address these questions. So the first one, what are one or two science questions that can only be answered with transient data observed during run up to and during eruptions? How do we identify and manage precursory signals? And then during later stages of the report writing, we will look at uh, what are the resources require, resource requirements for data and sample sharing and dissemination, what are mechanisms for funding rapid response to US volcanoes, and what are the processes of, for obtaining permits on the ground. Next slide. We are also thinking about facilities and we are in communication with the Natural Hazards Reconnaissance Facility that is run out of uh, the engineering program at NSF. This facility actually has some equipment that could be useful for volcano response such as drones, some cameras, some seismic stations. And I've been in touch with uh, Lori Peak, who is the PI, and jo Joseph Wortman, who is the uh, director uh, of the Natu uh, Natural Hazardous Reconnaissance Facility, RAPID. And we will meet up at AGU to discuss this further. So this facility has some equipment. However, we feel that likely we need additional or different equipment um, and that there should be some sort of facility for, uh, for the Converse uh, program or Converse RCN. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, out of these workshops and initial conversations, we think that Converse is going to be uh, really successful in building this scientific community and bridging the uh, correspondence and collaboration between the academic volcano community and the USGS and NASA folks who are also obviously interested in volcano processes. And we hope that the Converse idea could remain an entity beyond the two year uh, NSF grant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobias. Um, so let's start with again the committee members. Are there any one or two questions just for Tobias? Doug, do you have a question? Yeah, just have a quick one. Um, and it's maybe an unusual one. I'm just curious, how do you measure success in an initiative like this as compared to what a baseline might be? Yeah, so uh, measuring success in such an initiative would entail being able to instrument volcanoes and get uh, people organized prior to and during an eruption to collect these critical data. So for example, some volcanoes erupted recently, Bogoslav is an example, and um, many of the precursory signals were not uh, effectively recorded. And so a lot of information was lost about the run up to this eruption as well as the actual eruption. So success would be to 
collect data prior to eruption and get some time series uh, information of the type that I showed uh, as examples leading up to the eruption in real time and then hopefully understanding what is happening and being able to better forecast what is happening at the, when the eruption is happening and what size it'll be and so forth. Okay, and you, and you would be able to represent that this would not have occurred or this kind of effort would not occur without this kind of facilitation? Yeah, I think so because, um, for example, we have new instrumentation now that we could uh, deploy on these volcanoes that would allow us to collect um, much better data. For example, NASA has very sophisticated uh, remote sensing techniques that um, you know, they could possibly use at certain volcanoes and then collect data that the USGS by themselves would not be able to collect. So the academic con community can significantly contribute to the volcano monitoring efforts that are currently ongoing. Okay, thank you. Great, are there any other committee members who might have a question for Divya? I'd, I'd like to ask a quick question. Mm-hmm. Um, right, so I, I might have missed this because I had to step out for a second, but um, how do you envision international uh, sort of partnerships here with data? Because I mean, certainly, you know, there are lots of uh, observe volcano observatories out there from, you know, certainly all along Central America, South America, Europe. Um, and, you know, how do you envision this might contribute uh, to, the, to the effort of collecting data or analyzing what's a precursor to an eruption and so on? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, this RCN currently is focused on US volcanoes only. However, we envision that our data that we collect will go into databases that will inform the international volcano community. So if we collect data, let's say at Augustine and um, you know, we find some interesting precursory activity, we would envision to put that data into a, a database. For example, it could be the VOVO database where uh, folks can then access that data and use our precursory information or precursory data to better understand data that they are collecting at their volcanoes wherever in Central America, South America, uh, you know, Asia, to better understand volcanic processes in general. Because what we're observing are precursory signals that are not just typical for one volcano, but they have occurred at many different volcanoes. Does that answer your question? Partly, but we can revisit later. <laughs> Okay, maybe, um, are there any more questions for Tobias? And if not, um, wait, one, two, three. Um, if not, what I think I'll do is open up the questions um, for any of our speakers. And I think Bruce has the, the first question for that. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Deb. And thank you to the three of you. It's been really very, very enlightening. I have really one or two comments. They may lead into questions. And th there is a proviso that both of them arise, I think, uh, <clears throat> from the context. That, of course, we're at a very early stage in this process. But the first comment is simply, at the moment, the interface between parts, major building blocks of SD, um, for the isn't necessarily that that clear and what I mean is for example you could you can hear 20 minutes talking about the modeling uh, collaboratory uh, without any reference to the, a vital need for new observational information and you can also hear about the new observational initiatives but the link to the modeling isn't isn't there and I think in any environment like this a webinar, it's pretty critical to, to demonstrate that these, these are not absolutely separate initiatives that don't rely on each other, but there is a dependency there. Uh, I, I'm sorry, so I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the comment. 
speaking for the modeling collaboratory, the integration of data from the different disciplines is a very important part here. And the alignment of the computational geoscience with the observational one is, is crucial for this. And it's actually a very, it's a new model that's being suggested here where you can think of subduction zones as just one exemplar of a new way of doing business, right? If you think about Sage Gage and Pascal deployments, for example, how many times have we done deployments and then we couldn't answer or address the hypotheses that we meant to answer, right? And what is suggested here is to complement the data collection efforts with a modeling effort that's very much geared toward optimal experimental design, right? What's suggested here is an incorporation of data streams in terms of a real-time model of the state of a volcano or megathrust. So I'm not quite sure where the data didn't quite make it in there. And in terms of the relationships to SC40, SC40, I think, as a wider umbrella thing, will be crucial for us, for the, for the United States to help advance subduction zone signs, perhaps with an investment in our local subduction zones. And it will be outstanding if we can incorporate those data streams in the future. But the modeling collaboratory can start with this effort right now, right, with the existing global data. So I wonder if you could clarify what, what, what your concern is here. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, and you come right to it with those last remarks. There's nothing in what you presented to suggest that there's any need for new data at this point in time. You could oh. argue simply that there the could be terrific development in modeling approaches and in code without necessarily any new data. Uh, and so a cynic might say, right, let's take the modeling uh, collaboratory and treat that as simply an entity, a standalone entity. Why does it need to be in an, why does it need an umbrella? And I, I'm, I'm not arguing, that I, that's not, I'm doing that as devil's advocate. That's not my own perspective. But I'm saying, you guys, if you want to preserve this large entity, have to make it very, very clear that you need new data. I think it's much easier for them to say they need new models. If I could chime in, um, uh, yeah, I, we take that on board very much, but I think that that's exactly what is going on, and maybe we need to make sure we convey it even even more forcefully. Um, one of them, I was a, attended both of the MCS uh, workshops, and one of the most remarkable things is the degree to which the modelers spend almost all their time talking about the need for observations, and uh, demonstrating to us the ways in which um, well constructed models and modeling schemes drive um, uh, clarity in what observations are most useful to make and pinpointing exactly what kinds of new observations are needed from the, the, the infrastructure and field experiments. Um, it's very clear that we can't blanket the entire world with geophysical and geochemical instruments and geological studies. So we need to pick and choose and target very well. And we've, um, we've heard quite a bit actually already out of the MCS about exactly how models can drive targeting of those experiments to get the most bang for the buck, is, if you will. So um, I think yeah, that, I, that, that, and Torsten showed us some of the data sets already that really uh, are driving the modeling community. And as you said, Bruce, it's absolutely true that the models can drive not only the field experiments, but also the laboratory experiments. Um, yeah, so and I, I'm really only saying, how keep that word new in mm -hmm. front every time somebody says data because uh, uh, otherwise you can say there are some wonderful data sets out there you know which which are underutilized at the, at the present time and that's not my perspective at all I'm, I'm on your side in this um, my other comment however is the timing of our report is not ideal in terms of the timing of the development of SC4D. You know, it would be nice if our report was two or three years hence, in, in many ways. It isn't. And one of the things that comes out at the moment, and this is inevitable, is the open-endedness of SC4D at the moment. And by that, I mean, when you see a map of seduction, you show a map of seduction zones around the world, what strikes people is the, the diversity in terms of the level of existing infrastructure, the, the existing state of knowledge, 
the ease or difficulty of assembling decadal scale new data sets. So it, it's, it's a hard sell at this stage. It'll be much better in one or two years time. It's, it's, it's harder for a group like ours to totally endorse everything that's going on board at this very, very early stage. And that's just a comment, it's not a criticism. Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that. And we, we wish the same in a way. I mean, the, essentially what I laid out was that the next year, I think the next 12 months or so is the critical time for kind of honing in both geographic focus and, uh, and kind of intellectual um, uh, question focus that can be tractable and addressed in the kind of program that we're, we're designing. Those global maps are certainly not maps of what we expect to do in the sense that all of those things are are very unlikely to be on the table for say major new infrastructure. Um, for the intellectual questions though, I think that we can recognize that there's a lot of the global that's already being worked on well. Uh, there are key areas where key questions um, exist and uh, we're pulling in on all of those. You know, maybe a more, a more concise answer, or a more uh, concrete answer to Carolina's earlier question about how this differs from geoprisms and EarthScope too could be stated something like that, um, you know, EarthScope, uh, what EarthScope did very, very well was, was this big data collection, um, but maybe I think it would be fair to say, and probably people wouldn't disagree, that it was basically a geophysical experiment and didn't incorporate um, a very deeply integrated, you know, sort of geochemical, geological, modeling and other things into the EarthScope program itself. Geoprisms, the other side of the coin, had virtually no, uh, you know, sort of uh, sustained long-term data collection of its own, although it ran a number of, of, of campaign field programs, um, but didn't have an infrastructure component. Yet what it did do extremely well, or has done extremely well, is integrating uh, these various disciplinary areas into really truly multidisciplinary science for both subduction zone and, and uh, rifted margin problems. And so taking those two key aspects and making sure a new program actually draws on the best of both is, uh, is critical and goes, I think, directly to your question about the integration. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, yes, thank you. That's very really useful. And if I actually, you know, could have a concrete example of, you know, how geoprisms did something that has changed how we think about either subduction zone or a rifted margin, I think I, it would be useful for me to understand, uh, uh, you know, something concrete. Um, but I, I see Bruce's point, and I think you've both, both answered this, that I think, uh, you know, as it, it's perhaps it's just a matter of semantics and words, you know, the you could see these as completely separate entities, even though, you know, the idea is that they would work together, right? Um, the, the, the modeling collaboratory and the observational side, let's put it that way. You could see them as separate entities on their own, you know, funded on their own that someone enterprising might integrate at some point, right? Um, what it would be nice to see, I think, it's that one necessitates the other. Um, you know, that you cannot do one without the other. I think that's what I would like to see. I mean, I, I totally see that, that the need, but I, I'm just saying it would be nice to convey that one cannot exist without the other in an effective way. Yeah, and I, I mean, you're, <clears throat> I, I, I guess I agree with everything that was commented on here, and it's, it's, it's interesting, and we're dealing with, with a number of different things, right? As, you know, Harold said, EarthScope was, was great, but had several shortcomings. For one, as you said, it was disciplinarily quite focused. And for me, as a geodynamicist, I, I, you know, I felt that, you know, we really, in the end, didn't yet bring it all together to understand continental dynamics that much better than before, right? We have all this stuff that we know now sits under the plate, but what does it do? We don't really still don't know. And so when I first attended, what was then an SEO uh, meeting, thinking about the follow-up, right? I raised my hand and I was like, please, this time let's integrate something from the bottom up that deals with process, right? And so I think SC40 as, a, as an initiative would very much benefit from something like the modeling collaboratory to have an interaction with the people who are doing the observations, right? And I think that's where, that's where the added value comes in. 
the modelers can tell the geodesists where to measure things to get a better locking estimate, right? And on the other hand, working with the observation lists tells the modelers which sort of codes to build to be able to map the data. And also working with the folks who are interested in hazard drives the modelers forward to do better in terms of uncertainty quantification, robustness of models and so on. However, it is true that the modeling collaboratory itself can sort of stand on its own and is a little bit more of a philosophy how we should maybe push science forward by integrating modeling with data collection and subduction zones is like I mentioned one example where this could really be beneficial right and so I think if if you if you're like want to narrow it down to subduction zone science which in itself is quite broad but if you want to narrow it down, I think for us as, as you know, scientists working in the US, you know, engaging now with a modeling collaboratory would be great because we can already start the conversation with the national community that's further ahead in terms of these observatories. And then SC40, once it comes online, right, we can sort of go on that and be more of a partner internationally when it comes to the observations. Right? So there's different ways to, um, to think about it and it's not really, sort of my place to comment on this further, but it's true that the modeling collaboratory has a lot of you know, in independent value, but there's really benefits of doing it with SC40. And to have that as an example, to, to do a big scale infrastructure investment for the first time in a way that's, that is taking the modeling seriously to actually deliver on saying something about the scientific hypotheses we want to test and to deliver something in terms of hazard, decadal scale, physics-based, hazard assessment for volcanoes and earthquakes, right? And so we've, we've tried bits and pieces of that before, right? And, and there are lessons, not just from earthquake, but also from, you know, SCEC, for example. And, and I think it's time to do something a little bit new here. And we're all seeing the challenges that are involved in that, right? How, how do we do that? Uh, what's the timeline? You know, which agencies do we engage with, right? How do we, how we, do, how do, we do that? But I think there is, there's a, there's a huge opportunity here and there's, there's a lot of excitement. And I think we have, a, we have a mandate to do something about figuring out these precursors, just picking one example. Just very briefly to cap that off, you know, I think the value of in keeping the, in the modeling collaboratory inside a framework like SC4D is we have all this talent and firepower and potential for leveraging computational power. Um, that could happily go off and work on very important and interesting subduction zone problems along with lots of other things. But if we keep it focused on the same questions that the uh, observational side is looking at, then we just, we concentrate all of that into the, into the same problems. I think we just have a much more powerful community. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump in for one second because we have at least two other questions from committee members. Uh, Tim, I think you're next and then we'll take Donna. Hey, uh, this is a question for, I guess, any of the three of you could answer, but maybe Harold is best, uh, best qualified to answer. It has to do with question six that was in Deb, Deb Glickson's list of uh, pre-questions. So most subduction zones are outside the US and uh, we can make a big contribution to our science just by getting data that's already be, being collected in those places uh, by other uh, national agencies uh, more widely distributed. Um, so I'd like to get, I'd like to see a little bit more effort on getting these uh, international partners involved from the get-go. I am concerned that right now they're not intimately involved, that they're kind of an after, uh, I've, heard it, I've heard it talked about as an afterthought, and I think it would be more fruitful to get them involved in the planning process early on so that they feel like they are real partners. Um, we can't instrument the whole world, so maybe we should start by focusing on places where international partners are willing to do uh, contribute and do some of the heavy lifting. So that's a, a point that any of the three of you could address perhaps. Yeah, thanks Tim. I mean, that's a, that's a comment that's really important and, and, a, and a topic I should say that's really important to us. And it, 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 it's true that um, there's been a certain amount of trying to, uh, to sort of um, get a good grasp on what the scope of what's being attempted here um, <clears throat> is important. Uh, in order to really drive what the key questions are with some of those international partners. But having said all of that, then it's really clear that as you look around the world, first of all, that um, 
that uh, this is not intended on the on the either the the sort of megathrust side or actually the arc volcano side um, beyond the converse uh, program to be U.S. to be U.S. only or U.S. focused or be just Cascadian Aleutians or something like that. That's that's a that's certainly not what's envisioned by by the steering committee for the umbrella. What is envisioned is leveraging exactly that off of you know we can sort of divide the world of international partners up into places that are already doing a lot um, with very interesting subduction zone systems where we just want to directly partner with them and kind of leverage off data that's being collected. Ones that are um, at various stages of building up infrastructure or observations in really interesting places from the point of view of the key problems that are being addressed. Um, just a concrete example of that might be Chile or a couple of the different Central American uh, nations, you know, from Mexico through to Costa Rica and so on. Um, where there's the real possibility of a direct partnership that will involve U.S. infrastructure, uh, partnering with things that are already happening in those places. Um, and then there are international partners from the form of, of other sort of, let's call it deep resources uh, countries that are heavily engaged in the research without being sort of field sites of their own, like let's say Germany, for example. And, you know, a country like Japan fits into more than one of those categories simultaneously. Um, so, you know, we are uh, now organizing a, a meeting with a bunch of key players from about um, eight or nine different, uh, different, different countries, uh, Mexico, Chile, Japan, New Zealand, um, well, the Singapore group and uh, Australian groups that relate to Indonesia up through Myanmar, uh, field sites, and, and so on. There, there are a number of others, Germany, UK. Um, I didn't mention, um, but there's also this uh, U.S. NERC uh, uh, um, partnership, U.S.-U.K. Uh, partnership proposal to do a Mediterranean subduction zone observatory or MED, Med SZO um, in in the Hellenic Arc that is um, is already ongoing and has a whole bunch of U.S. collaborators along with a, a big group from from U.K. Uh, several different um, EU nations, including Greece and Italy, but also Germany and, uh, and France. Um, and so, so there are a number of steps going on um, that haven't really sort of shown up in the public view of our, of our uh, website or activities yet, but that I think will start emerging over just the next few months. And we're inviting some of those key international partners to this January kickoff meeting of the working groups. Um, so there's some structural reasons why we wanted to get our domestic team uh, uh, all onto the same page and starting to pull in the same direction, but it's pretty clear that if we want to do a solid and effective science program, it's going to involve a number of locations around the world and we'll have to involve that kind of data leveraging. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, chime in quickly here. I completely agree. This, this has to be an international effort and I see the modeling collaboratory as serving the, the global community really in a way that is engaging with similar efforts and that is hopefully, hopefully providing, you know, value, real value for the global community. So our RCN has um, travel support for international participants built in anticipating this and uh, we had you know, for example, uh, folks from UNAM give keynotes at our Megathrust workshop was really quite inspiring. We had great participation from Europe and Japan. And as, as Harold mentioned, you know, there's, there's different ways to, to engage. Um, I spend personally a lot of time talking with Takana Hori at Gemstech, who's part of a very similar Japanese modeling effort. They are trying to move their computer hardware beyond exascale, what have you. And he's the leader. Uh, on that part of this Japanese project to integrate data streams from their seafloor observatories into physical models. Very much what we're trying to do. And I met with folks uh, from NIED running the network and asking me, so what should we do in terms of complementing our data streams with physical models? The Japanese are facing this challenge and they have already made huge investments and we're hoping to really benefit from each other. So far, uh, you know, we've played the role of being each other's cheerleaders. I'm going to attend an earthquake engineering conference in Kobe next year just to, to be a cheerleader and help out the Japanese. And I hope that these investments in terms of personal ties will pay off. Um, I mentioned um, the European cheese initiatives where the Europeans are actually sort of, again, a little bit ahead of high performance computing in the solid earth communities in some extent when it comes to training and supporting the workflows. Uh, 
you know, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with those folks. There's EPOS, the European Plate Boundary Observatory System that we're hoping to tie in. So, so, so very much, right? We, it should be global. And as you all know, there are challenges, right? The communities operate in different, have different cultures of operating, access to data, um, is, you know, is treated differently. Uh, the degree of openness is, is unclear sometimes. And so um, there are challenges, right? And we are aware of those and there are ways of engaging. For example, I was part of a SCEC, um, Earthquake Research Institute, Tokyo NIED summer school program a while back, very much with the idea of exporting some of the culture to data sharing to different communities and get engaging and building long-term personal context so that the students who partake in our workshops in a couple of years down the line will be faculty and then grow into leadership positions. So yeah, I mean, this is, I think we have important choices here to make as to what we do with our US science and how we maintain leadership. But of course, the science is global and we need to understand the different subduction zones. And, and even if, if our investment is say in Cascadia or in Alaska, we need to bring in these other communities. We need to bring in this other, these other data and integrate them for sure. Tobias, did you want to respond? Yeah, just uh, I agree with everything that's been said. That's uh, a really good response to that question. From the volcano side, of course, the RCN is a U.S. volcano focused. And we have, of course, a lot of good collaborations with the international uh, community of volcanologists. And we could immediately implement our processes internationally if you know the observatories and the other collaborators would be okay with that but that's kind of the point of this rcn we want to put in place protocols and ways to monitor volcanoes and collect key data and then you know we could implement that uh, anywhere around the world in collaboration with local observatory observatories and local scientists can, can I add to that so that you so what, what Tobias just said in fact is the larger picture part of the the magmatic drivers of eruption subgroup of the umbrella RCN so the converse RCN that Tobias told you about has a specific mandate for the US volcano sort of um, response but the larger SC4D has a much broader portfolio and um, so that group um, that subgroup is being led up by uh, Diana Roman and Terry Plank and they are talking about this, you know, um, common set of instrumentation on a number of, of volcanoes to be selected. And they're talking a lot about Central American volcanoes, just for example, uh, as well as South American, um, as well as, you know, uh, uh, Alaska, Aleutians and other places. So that international collaboration is also moving well along within the volcano side of SD40. Great, thank you. Um, Donna, finally. Let's get you unmuted. Am I unmuted? Okay. Yep, now you are. Uh, this is unanswerable, but I wanted to just explore more about the overarching um, sort of questions of SV4D. You said you, it won't be all things subduction, so there's a hazard focus, but it's on the fundamental processes that underlie hazards, which is kind of everything, right? I mean, you showed a beautiful picture of a blue schist, eclogite, um, if you look at the presentations in your upcoming AGU session, you know, there's not real obvious connection to hazards sometimes. So how, how do you grapple with this that, that you could pretty much say, oh, it's on a subduction zone, so it's on hazards. Um, just what kind of discussion or how will you, how will you decide what uh, is included? Yeah, I, I think, that, like you said, that's a great question at the it gets to the heart of the fundamental philosophical question of how to do all of this. Um, uh, I think one part of it is just make, you know, inculcating a culture within the SC40 community of recognizing that despite the fact that we can define things pretty broadly, we still need to be cognizant of and draw those links back to what the, what the process that one is studying is, what it has to do with the fundamental hazard questions. I mean, an example of that is both I and uh, uh, Torsten showed uh, essentially, you know, aspects of the, the mantle dynamics and let's say viscous or viscoelastic plastic response to 
uh, either precursory or post um, uh, earthquake events and, and looked at you know, how that much larger scale response drives the loading, uh, the stress loading of the, of the part of the plate boundary that actually is, is, um, uh, is locked and, and going to participate in rupture. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, I think that, it won't, that SC40 will prioritize uh, all types of um, uh, numerical simulation of, 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 you know, the flow at the largest scale of subduction systems and slabs and so on. Um, it's going to have to parse out those questions and really decide which things are, are important to target and focus on. So that's one example where the aspects of that kind of geodynamic scale work that would be prioritized will still have to link back. Um, we could make similar kind of statements about processes driving, driving volcanic systems. Um, to use one of the old phrases from the margins and geoprisms days, the subduction factory uh, was a thing that generated lots of really interesting questions and really interesting science from the point of view of, of uh, everything that goes into the subduction zone driving what comes out uh, the volcanoes. Not all aspects of that, to me, uh, fit into the SC4D mandate. Uh, parts of it do, and parts of it would be seen as, as broader, important, but different uh, scientific questions surrounding the subduction system. Um, the, the earthquake community within SC4D, I think, is really um, focused on emphasizing, especially from the point of view of the experiments that can be done and the models that can be run, things that actually can tackle tractable questions about you know, the drivers of rupture, for example, and uh, how loading leads up to, to a rupture event, and then um, what happens dynamically in response to a set of existing sort of quasi-static conditions at the beginning of an earthquake. Um, so there's still lots of science to do that's very broad around that zone, but it's got to be tied in. That's, that's, I think that's my best answer to that, and I'd be happy to hear the others chime in on it. I guess I, I can comment on that, and... Um... You know, I, I think the, the, the goal of providing the physical models for volcano and earthquake hazard assessment is an exciting one, is one that can help us hone in on our science. But just taking the Megathrust uh, workshop we just had as an example, one of the most exciting talks was by, by John Platt, who told us about microstructure and geological constraints on the Megathrust. And, uh, I think it's a, it's a true statement that if you're trying to figure out how a certain megathrust operates, you, you need to understand processes that go on on, on million year time scale, you know, in terms of how does the accretionary wedge uh, respond to the setting? What is the interaction with long-term mass transport of the overriding plate landscape ev evolution? But also, what, what are the tectonics doing? How is the back arc spreading? How are different trenches advancing or retreating? All of those on time scales of a million year will affect the general state the megathrust operates. And then from there, you can go down to shorter time scales. Now, the modeling collaborator for seduction will probably not be concerned with questions like, did plate tectonics operate four billion years ago? But the tools we will hopefully help and contribute to can be used for research on whatever sort of geodynamic problem you want to to apply it to in this planet or other planets. So I think it, it helps helps to focus, but it's really quite quite broad. And so the you know we're trying to walk that balance and um, you know asking just again as an example for the mega thrust, how is the mega thrust loaded, right? That gives you a way to focus. And I think that means you've got to understand trench retreat and you, you know, and you have to understand the shorter timescales as well. But it's, okay, it's any yeah, but it's, very, ahead, it's not just geophysics, right? I like to emphasize this, <laughs> and it's geology, petrology, rock mechanics. It's trying to bring it all, all in there and trying to, you know, give, not just say we need more data, right? We always need more data, but to give more specific answers, like maybe we don't need to understand this particular aspect of, you know, rate dependent friction. Maybe we need to understand a different component. Maybe we don't need better seismic data everywhere, but maybe we need highly detailed, you know, surveys in a certain location. And we're hoping to understand sort of how the different skills talk to each other, right? Sort of, if you build a dynamic rupture model 
what is the information in active soil seismics that you can use about roughness and structure and, and, and what can we do and what can we, can we not do, you know? Okay, great. Um, do any of the committee members, any other committee members have any other questions? All right, not hearing any. Um, are there any other questions from anyone who's on the line? And you'll just have to unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do one last call for questions. If, oh, Donna, do you have another question? I do. I, I just wanted to ask more about cyber infrastructure and whether it would be something at an SC Board D level um, coordinating the different um, uh, other aspects or interacting with, I don't know, IRIS, UNAVCO, or uh, how would you deal with it? It's, I know it's a huge issue. Um, let's see, maybe all of us could tackle parts of that. Torsten, do you want to talk first about for big scale computing? Yeah, so um, from the modeling collaborator perspective, I, I think there are many opportunities to engage with different uh, community initiatives. And so uh, I, for example, if you take Sage Gage, right? Um, uh, I think something like a modeling collaboratory approach would very much be useful for sage gauge operations in general, right? The next time you want to collect, um, you know, data somewhere, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can figure out what by running uh, forward models and by producing synthetic data as to what you should, where you should be observing what to test whatever you want to test, right, in general. And I think we can, dis, we can do this better now because the geodynamic codes and capabilities have advanced sufficiently. So we, I think, personally, should get really serious about sort of a third leg here in terms of computational geoscience helping us out in terms of guiding observational efforts for any sort of sage gauge activities and the infrastructural needs that uh, you know, are similar, right? We're already doing that, people are already doing this with global wave propagation computations to complement observations. So data storage and things like that, there's commonality and really a lot of value in engaging. Now, there's other efforts supported by NSF, for example, EarthCube, right? EarthCube has invested a lot of money in terms of developing infrastructure that we hope to engage with in terms of the modeling collaboratory when it comes to reproducibility for example, right? So there is, there is sort of getting the workflows out there completely for complete transparency. That's a, that's a challenge for individual PIs and EarthCube can help with that. Now, in terms of the hardware access, the modeling collaboratory, you know, would, should make it easier for people to access high performance computing to say, take our Lego pieces, put them together, load in the structural model for Cascadia, and then run your particular test case that you're interested in on the biggest computers. We are hoping to, to facilitate that, and we can't do that alone, but the modeling collaboratory will have to engage with the supercomputing center that has expertise in doing that, such as, such as TAC, not to, just because it's sitting here on top of TAC, but such as TAC to, to, um, to help with that. Right, and there's precedent for that, and and I think there's ways of engaging with whatever the future CAG will do. Right, where um, you know CAG has, has has done a lot of great stuff and is a little bit in a, in a sort of in, in a reorganization stage itself. Right, and so there's there's ways how you can see different uh, entities within Solid Earth to to usefully work together. Um, and so I guess my answer is. You know, EarthCube is really important, for example, for the workflows, Sage Gauge, in terms of the ways of having data and computations at the same place. Um, and I think uh, the modeling collaborator can help out Sage Gauge. And uh, then CIG, you know, it really depends on what the future CIG will do. But there is a need to interface more with the supercomputing centers, right? Because the supercomputing centers have expertise there in terms of having access to data storage and things like that. I can just add that from the point of view of the kind of the broad SC40 picture, um, <clears throat> well, for some, you know, some things are easier and some are harder. So for the, the, the kinds of uh, 
systems that are now getting well established and aren't perfect but getting better and better like um, everything that Iris and UNAVCO does and so on. There's not much appetite for reinventing, reinventing wheels, but much better for partnering with, with whatever entity comes out of uh, the Sage Gage Iris UNAVCO world in the next couple of years. Um, and for using the systems that are there and certainly a total commitment to open data access and the idea that these are community experiments. Now the hard, harder nuts to crack, of course, are the geological data, the laboratory data, um, you know, the, the kind of interoperability of models and all these other things. So that's the discussion that still is ongoing, or is at an early stage, I think it's fair to say. Um, but uh, some of the exciting things coming out of the EarthCube world in terms of um, uh, using uh, data mining techniques to, and, and other things to get at how to bring geological data onto and, and geochemical data onto more into more archivable database systems are what's under discussion. Uh, we don't have a lot of concrete things to say about that side of data for SC4D specifically yet, just because I think of the stage that we're at. Um, it's in the discussion. I guess I, I had a few more things come into came to mind. One is, of course, big data and machine learning, right? Where machine learning is just sort of another tool that will possibly be usefully applied here. So we will complement physically deterministic mechanisms with machine learning whenever useful, right? And, and we had another interesting workshop on that at, at COSG. But in terms of what we're going to do with the, with the cyber infrastructure, I think it's, we, we've learned a lot of lessons from the past decades of the community trying to do that. And, and for the modeling collaboratory, it's really science first. And it's the science that has to drive the code development. And we want to make sure that we have very close integration. We want to work with computer scientists and engineers, but the science has to be the driver. And we want to make sure we're not in a situation where we're building products for, you know, and we don't know our customers. And we want to have the science be the driver. And another thing that we, we've learned is from past efforts is that if we're trying to couple things, right? We always, we've been trying to couple things for 20 years, but what was really clear, for example, at the surface process um, lithospheric deformation workshop that NSF sponsored where CSDMS, another community organization which we haven't talked about and CIG co-sponsored is that if you want to do coupling right, you need to do it at a very low level. You need to take a code, take this other code, take off all the bits and pieces and then integrate them at the low level. And that is hard, but that is the only way to really do it if you want to respect um, you know, the, the proper physics and the time scales inherent in it. And so we need to, to do a lot of sort of nitty gritty stuff. We can't just put it all together bits and pieces, but we want to do it in a way that's driven by the science, if that makes sense. So we're very much engagement with these initiatives, but keep the science um, be the driver and have the scientists guide and do the code development. That is, I think, really important. Yeah, I just want to add to that. And um, of course, from the volcano science side, data is uh, you know, very, very important. And ideally, we want that data to feed into the models to help us really forecast what's happening at these eruptions. And uh, for deformation and uh, seismic data, we have UNAFCO and IRIS, but for example, for gas data or for images from eruptions, for tephra size distribution, dynamic uh, in information from eruptions that are ongoing, we currently don't have any uh, place to put those data and uh, get them uh, accessible for people in a modeling collaboratory to really go in there and use that data and, you know, try their models with that data that is collected in real time. So we're collecting these high frequency data, many different types of data, but we don't have places for these data to go. And those discussions will be held at the uh, workshop in, in March that will happen here to really figure out what, what to do with these things. Thank you all so much for the answers to those questions. Um, I think we might have time for one more question. So if anybody would like to ask one, please unmute and jump in. Or not. Okay, um, then instead what I'd like to do is on behalf of the committee, I'd like to um, sincerely thank Harold, Torsten and Tobias for taking the time to provide this information 
um, about the RCNs to the CORES Committee. It's been incredibly helpful, um, and we really do appreciate the time you've taken. Um, for oh, oh, thank you, Torsten. Um, for everyone on the line, um, there will be a video of this webinar available probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, and it will be available, I believe, on our CORE's website. Um, if you have any particular questions, please feel free to email me. And uh, that's dglickson at nas.edu, D-G-L-I-C-K-S-O-N um, at nas.edu. And um, I wanted to thank you all. And that's it. Have a great Monday.